Okay, everybody, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Um, welcome. Uh, this is, um, uh, what is our um, latest release webinar where we will be discussing and, and covering uh, some of the new functionality and uh, data sets that were loaded in our various databases. Uh, there are a couple of uh, things I want to uh, bring up, but before that, some housekeeping rules. So if you have any questions uh, throughout the webinar, uh, there is a panel on a, a GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar panel that allows you to type your questions, um, and we will uh, monitor uh, the questions as they come in and either answer them um, by um, by text by typing or we will answer them um, uh, verbally. Um, the other thing to note is that this webinar is recorded or will be recorded. And so if something goes too quickly, uh, don't worry. We will uh, make that webinar available to you and also uh, through our YouTube channel. Um, and uh, additionally, if you uh, prefer, you could also uh, use the raise hand function in uh, GoToWebinar. Uh, and this would indicate that uh, you have a question. And either we will unmute you and you can uh, express that question, or uh, it'll alert us to look in the question panel to see uh, what you have typed uh, there. Um, OK, so um, I wanted to, uh, before we get started with this webinar, uh, so this is basically one of the last webinars that focuses only on um, uh, parasitic uh, and fungal databases as uh, with the new uh, funding cycle of uh, the Bioinformatic Resource Centers, which is what uh, UPathDB has historically been a part of. Um, we are now a uh, merged project with uh, another uh, database group called uh, VectorBase, which supports uh, vectors of, uh, of pathogens. And, um, uh, and, and so the idea behind this is that uh, this resource for the next five years will expand and be able, be able to uh, incorporate uh, some nice new functionality from VectorBase uh, for the uh, protozoan and uh, uh, fungal communities and vice versa. Uh, a lot of the tools that are available uh, or have been available historically for the protozoan and fungal communities will become available for uh, the vector community. Uh, there is, if you go to any of the home pages, including uh, UPathDB, or if you um, uh, go to uh, VectorBase as well, um, you will see that um, uh, there is a uh, uh, announcement at the top of the page. Uh, and this announcement at the top of the page uh, links you to a letter to the community. Uh, and this letter includes uh, some more details and information uh, that may uh, interest you. There is currently a, um, uh, oh, and, uh, and one thing important to note is that uh, this new resource, um, uh, the merged resource, uh, is called ViewPathDB. So we'll be adding a V in front of ViewPathDB. Uh, so that accommodates uh, vectors, eukaryotic pathogens, uh, host, and uh, fungal organisms. Uh, there is a landing page right now for uh, ViewPathDB, but all it is is a landing page. Um, and so if you go to uh, viewpathdb.org, uh, this just shows you a page like this, which will get you to the different resources that are currently available. Uh, but um, our first uh, release uh, of a completely merged resource will uh, start rolling out in March of 2020. Uh, and so uh, this will change into a, um, a home page that looks more um, uh, functional and you'll be able to access data from it. Okay, so um, going back to our uh, uh, the, the goal of this uh, meeting today, it is to uh, really cover some of the new data sets that became available in the latest release of uh, the protozoan, uh, or, protozoan uh, or parasitic uh, databases and the fungal databases. Um, as usual, uh, if you're interested in knowing what's new in the various databases, the best place to go is, is the news section of um, uh, any of your databases. Either if you go to upathdb.org, there is a, a news section that integrates all of the news, or you can go to the individual databases and see um, What's, uh, what's available there. Um, and so um, let's see, as I go ahead and go back to, um, so as I mentioned, the different databases provide this. So here's a new section in, in uh, UPathDB, and it has an accumulation of all the releases or all the news from the different releases and with all the details. So for example, you quickly could see what was what's new in HostDB, 
Um, you will see that Amoeba, B, Amoeba DB did not receive any data sets um, and so forth. So not all of our databases get um, data for each release. Um, and that's, that's not, not surprising. Uh, for the last release, for example, we loaded uh, close to 50 different uh, data sets in our different uh, components. So it's a lot of data, but not everybody gets data every, every release. Okay, so uh, what we're going to be doing today, so uh, I'm here with um, uh, Evelina Bashenko, who um, is a fungal specialist and will be covering uh, some of the new data and functionality in Fung FungiDB. Um, so we're going to start with uh, updates to FungiDB, and so I'll switch over to Evelina in a second. And then after she's done, I will, uh, and I'm, my name is Omar Harp, I'm uh, the second outreach person from uh, the UK Pathogen Databases, and I will be um, covering uh, new data and functionality made available in uh, the various uh, uh, parasitic uh, databases. Okay, so uh, I will go ahead and um, switch control to um, Eve, and let's see if I can do that easily. Hi, everyone. Uh, while Lamar switches the screens, um, I will just briefly tell you what we're going to cover in a few moments. Um, you should be able to see my screen by now, which um, is a FungiDB, and I will click on the um, FungiDB release um, news located in the left panel. So there's a few data sets that we have loaded in the past release, and um, these include uh, several genomes, transcriptomics, proteomics, SNPs, phenotype data, and also updates for the um, Aspergillus niger, which I will touch base um, on a few um, of those data sets in a few moments. But we will start um, by looking at the transcriptomics, one of the transcriptomics data sets that we have loaded um, in this release, and that's specifically for Aspergillus fumigatus. So I'll navigate back to the main landing page and notice that there are three search um, windows, essentially. We will work with the one that is called search for genes. And what it means that essentially any search deployed from this area will produce a list of genes that correspond to the selection criteria that you have chosen. We will look um, right now at the transcriptomics evidence um, to navigate to the a list of RNA-seq datasets. I'll click on RNA-seq evidence. And let me just make my screen just a tiny bit bigger. Um, RNA-seq evidence. And here's a list of um, datasets that we have now have in FongiDB. Those that have been recently loaded are marked by a little um, icon that says new. And I'm specifically interested in looking at the A. fumigatus gene, where um, the researchers compared essentially transcriptomics profiles in the dormant canidia, germinating canidia, and um, hyphae, and also a few mutants. So I'll click on the full change button, and that essentially will bring me up um, to a screen where now I'm ready to select um, the criteria of my search. So before we move on actually setting up the query, I want to walk you through briefly with, uh, through um, uh, is what we're actually looking at here. So there's a few samples, as you can see, listed in the reference and the comparison samples, and that's essentially de depending on what type of search you're selecting, your HIFA, for example, could be your reference sample, or it could be the sample where you actually will be looking for different, uh, differently expressed genes. Um, but there's a few things to keep in mind. So our uh, wild type has been essentially tested in three conditions, hyphae, canidia, and germinated canidia. And there's also a few samples right here in the bottom, which indicates a different strain of Aspergillus unigatus that have been tested, and also a mutant, which is a delta ATF8. So what is very interesting about fungi is um, that canidia tend to germinate when the correct, um, uh, in the correct conditions, such as presence of water or nutrients, and ATFA is actually a B-zip um, type of transcriptional regulator that has been shown to have a crucial role in um, canidian dormancy meaning that if um, you construct mutations or delete this gene, the dormancy or the maintenance of the um, canidia state um, is actually disrupted. So here, for example, I will be interested in um, determining which genes are upregulated 
when you delete this major regulator of canidial dormancy and essentially compare that to the canidia that is unaltered, such as wild type canidia. So let's go ahead and set up our search. Um, for the reference sample, I'll use canidia. Uh, unaltered, and for our comparison sample, I will use Delta ATFA uh, mutants. Also, don't forget to set up um, the sort of the conditions for uh, for your search. Um, in this case, I'm interested in looking at the protein coding genes, and I also want to look at uh, significantly upregulated genes. And just for the purpose of demonstration, I want to look at the genes that have at least tenfold um, uh, upregulation. And so I'll go ahead and click answer. And so it will take a few um, moments to generate essentially a, um, a list of genes that correspond to your search. Notice that our uh, window has refreshed and now we have um, um, a little step that's now highlighted in yellow with 623 genes that are shown to have tenfold upregulation in the mutant. So what that means, uh, possibly, that the deletion of this gene, uh, in addition to sort of housekeeping genes that would, you would expect to be, to some extent, regulated in Canidia, there could be also some interesting observations, such as those genes that are directly regulated by ATF-A, um, and you as a researcher would uh, probably look further at individual genes within this list, also look at the expression profile, um, which are just uh, they are shown right here in the graph within the um, within the gene list, and potentially explore more to see well what kind of genes are actually represented within this list. Um, there's a few things that you can do with analysis. For example, you can analyze your results um, by doing go term enrichment. Or um, if you're working with, um, let's say, a different type of Aspergillus species, you can also convert your results uh, into orthologs in the different species for which um, no transcriptomic data sets such as this one is available. And I'll show you how to do that. So um, let's imagine that we are working with, um, uh, let's say, Aspergillus flavus. We know that Aspergillus flavus is a um, separotrophic and also pathogenic fungi. However, there's very little known um, about uh, canidial expression. So I will click on the Add tab and, um, and just uh, give it a little bit, um, a few minutes to refresh. And so here's a few options that you can work with to create essentially a second step to your search strategy. In my case, I'm interested in um, identifying orthologs of the genes in Aspergillus fumigatus that I just found in step one. Uh, and I'm interested in looking for orthologous genes in um, Aspergillus flavus. So when I click on transform by orthology, you will be redirected to a new screen that now essentially asks you for the organism that you wish to transform your genes in. And since this is a search box, I'll just start, uh, start typing Flavus, and here we are. I will select Aspergillus Flavus genome and click on the front step. So in the next few minutes, what this uh, search does is essentially compares our records and uh, um, our records on synteny and orthology in all species and essentially comes back with the list of genes that are orthologs of the 623 genes in Aspergillus fumigatus. As you can see, this is quite a powerful search because it allows you not only to sort of glean a, a potential function of genes in other species, but also have a flexibility to convert your results into multiple species and potentially compare uh, or detect the presence of one of the other genes in the species for which records um, have not been integrated in FungiDB yet. So, um, are there any questions? Uh, is yeah, there any question? Yeah, I just um, uh, answered a question by by typing, but the, just for everybody's sake, uh, the question is, is how does one decide how much fold change to select, 2, 3, 10, or 20, or 100? Uh, and my answer was really depends on the experiment and the, the type of analysis that, that was done. So, for example, uh, if it was a microarray experiment, uh, the dynamic range um, in the expression uh, differences is much less than in, uh, for example, RNA-seq. So typically for microarrays, uh, if you saw a twofold change, 
that was you know a, a good difference in in expression and then higher than that obviously you will get less and less and, and dramatically less genes that are that show that um, uh, full change with rna seq the dynamic range is much much wider and much higher and so uh, you can for example select a full change of 50 and depending on the experiment you might actually get genes that um, that math meet those criteria a 50 fold difference in, in expression um, so my advice typically is that obviously there's no gold standard I can tell you always select fourfold for RNA seq it's it doesn't work like that but um, it's always good to look at a known gene um, and and then see what kind of expression pattern that does that known gene have how much um, uh, you know how many uh, reads are there per that gene and so any gene page will include that information on there in the transcriptomic section um, and so I would recommend as you are exploring the data to take a look at one of those um, uh, experiments look at a gene that you know about or that's known that is expressed at a particular stage and see how it is expressed and what what differences are there and then use that as a as a starting point um, a lot of people I can say go with twofold even with RNA sequence data but um, but you will often get a lot of genes that have twofold difference and, and then the question is is at what stage do you um, do you say that that's a difference that's causing a change or a real biological difference it's the there the difference is there the full change in expression the question is is it actually sufficient to cause a, a difference okay sorry Eve go ahead mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, thanks. I was trying to show um, actually a nice RNA-seq um, summary page and gene record um, pages that we have recently implemented, but potentially MR will show it in the future um, in, in, in the next few minutes. Um, and that, that normally when you try to look at the um, expressions of the gene across um, different data sets, that could be something nice to look at just to see how the expression changes, not only depending on the sample uh, that you're working with, but at the conditions used. Um, and um, Omar, if, if you could, uh, maybe you, you could show this gene record page uh, in a few moments, or, or we'll come back to mine once it gets sure. loaded. Yeah. Um, all right, so the next um, a search that I would like to demo is actually concerning uh, the SNP records that we have recently loaded. And again, I'll navigate back to the to the home page and news just to point out um, as far as the where you can find um, the dataset record pages. So we have loaded um, a SNP dataset for Betraca um dendrobatitis, and that's essentially a um, non hyphal parasitic chytrid uh, fungus that have been associated with uh, uh, population declines across um, various countries that primarily affected um, amphibians. And um, this fungus is quite um, interesting and also difficult to eradicate as it's showing very quick um, adaptive diversity when you uh, put it under stress of um, sort of infection control. And um, we have integrated several um, data sets that have to do about sequencing of various isolates located not only from um, of various countries, uh, but also from different um, species. So we'll take a look at the SNP calls on um, BD Hammersmith project. And um, to navigate to, to this data set, you can do it essentially two different ways. You can click on the name of the data sets and I'll open it in a separate page. And it will take you to the data set record page, which gives you a little bit uh, more on uh, the background, the, the reference paper, et cetera. But also if you scroll down, it, it kind of gives you an idea of what type of searches you can create using this data set. You can also navigate to this data set directly from the home page, and I'll go back to the home page. And um, what I would like to do is to uh, show you the um, SNP characteristics search, which can be uh, uh, located after the, under the genetic variation, SNP characteristics. If you click on that link, uh, you are essentially redirected to a page that is um, essentially a, um, a parameter setup um, page for a SNP search. I will go ahead and select um, BD for 
different from the top menu. And note that it lists um, BD gel 423, which is a reference genome that we have used to align all the um, isolate data. And uh, once the page um, refreshes, you will be able to see all of the isolates contained within this um, project. It's taking a little bit. So let's try it again. Hmm. Interesting. Maybe I'm a little bit, maybe an internet is a little bit slow on my end. Um, let me refresh the page. Yeah, sometimes it happens if there's a delay in the uh, network. So. We'll give just a few moments. All right. Well, um, for some reason, it's not cooperating. So I will walk you through basically basic setup and then just show you um, uh, some of the results that I have uh, pre-run right before the webinar. So imagine we're working with um, with the Kitrid isolates, which will be listed um, right here. If you have multiple projects, all of the projects will be listed as well. You can navigate um, um, the isolates and the projects by looking at the host organisms that these isolates came from, et cetera, using the navigation menu on the left. And if you scroll down, um, there is essentially a list of uh, criteria that you can um, select depending on what type of um, SNPs you're interested in. For example, um, we will look at the, in this example, we will look at the non-synonymous SNPs um, and I will want to detect, to detect um, let's say at least five SNPs occurring within my class. So I want to find genes with multiple non-synonymous SNPs. So um, just kind of, in, in general, the reason why someone would want to look at the non-synonymous SNPs is that um, high rates of non-synonymous mutations can contribute to diversity and also adaptation of um, species and um, it also may indicate um, at some of the genes that are under selective pressure whether from the environment or some other uh, conditions. So when I click on get answer um, I will essentially run a search that will look for all non-synonymous SNPs five or more within um, uh, within the genes in BD. In this case, I will just navigate to the strategy that I have pre-run before. And these are essentially um, the SNPs that were returned for the um, chytrid fungus. I will highlight this step. So Eve, while you're clicking on that, just to, to say that I, I did um, try it from my end and that was able to load the parameters very quickly. So sometimes if there's a delay for some reason in the network, that filters, the filters take a while to show up. Okay. All right. So here we are. Um, as, as you noticed, I have identified over 2,000 genes that fit my criteria and they're listed right here in the results table. There's also an a additional um, additional columns that will um, sort of give you a summary of all of the type of SNPs that are detected. For example, there are some genes that have both non-synonymous and synonymous genes uh, that may have non-syn SNPs, but in this case, the first gene on our list has none. And also, if you scroll down to the right, there is um, other statistics, for example, a ratio of non-synonymous to synonymous SNPs um, that you may find useful if you're looking for the genes that under selective pressure. Note that this is just a ratio uh, that we provide using the data in the synonymous and non-synonymous columns. This is not uh, a calculation, it is not statistically a sort of significant calculation where you take into account genome length, and et cetera. So just the ratio. But if you know of a um, sort of certain genes that have um, been under selective pressure and you may want to just look at the ratio to potentially find interesting candidates if you look through. Um, a few things that you can do with, with this type of um, results. Well, first of all, you can look at the type of genes that are being returned, for example, by, by analyzing results further and enriching for, uh, for uh, gene ontology. You could also look at the individual um, 
gene record pages and um, at the SNP um, characteristics, for example. If I click on one of the conserved and predicted hypothetical genes, you will be navigated um, or redirected rather to the gene record page for this particular um, gene ID. And um, this page normally contains a wealth of information that includes um, essentially info within the uh, menu on the left. You can navigate to the SNP section and visualize essentially all of the SNPs that are mapped from all of the isolates that are integrated in FongiDB. And if you want to look even a little bit further, you can essentially click on individual SNPs to get a little bit more data about individual SNP. So know that um, those SNPs that are in yellow are non-coding, light blue are coding synonymous, dark blue are coding non-synonymous SNPs that we just have looked at. Um, an interesting thing about um, this particular chytrid fungus that um, it was noted in the past that those genes that were under selective pressure also had a, um, a, a signal uh, signal peptides. So one um, useful uh, search that you could create when looking for an interesting hit, it's essentially create a search strategy. In this particular case, you can add a step and um, look for genes with a um, certain uh, predict with, with certain domains. For example, we can look at the protein targeting and localization menu and specifically select to search for predicted signal peptides um, genes. And um, as, as you will see, the page will be refreshed. You'll be asked to select the genome that you are interested in. In this case, it's PD. And I will want to intersect. I want to say, all right, find all genes that have a non-synonymous SNP and also a predicted signal peptide. So in this case, I will choose an option one, intersect two, and I'll click on running step. Once the um, step uh, sort of finishes um, its analysis, you will um, uh, you will be led to essentially a screen. So let's see, it should be refreshed just in a second. Hmm. Well, it's thinking, maybe. <laughs> um, interesting. All right, let me see if I have pre-run this before. Here, here we are. Uh, we have some um, sort of internet issues in our end, um, but this is essentially what I was trying to, to, to show you. I set up a second search to intercept my results with those genes that have signal peptides, potentially identified in interesting targets that may be under selective pressure and also have um, secreted domain predictions. Um, all right, are there any questions? Keith, uh, yeah, I'm in the process of answering um... Um, a couple, there are a couple of questions actually, um, and I'll, I'll type the answer as well, but I'll, maybe we should answer them verbally. But uh, one question was, um, in the search uh, you ran for SNPs, there were many uh, hypothetical proteins. The question is, should these be included or, or what do they mean? Um, it's also a good question. I think the, the idea of a hypothetical protein, um, uh, I think often uh, people assume that that means that um, it is not known if it really encodes a protein. And the question is, well, how was it defined if something is known to encode a protein? And they're actually, depending on the standards you use, um, um, you know, you could be very, very stringent and say, well, as if I have evidence that this protein is made and I have proteomics evidence for the protein, then it's not hypothetical. Um, in that case, you know, there'll be a big percentage of your genome that even with, with known proteins, <laughs> would be considered, um, you know, quote unquote, hypothetical. But in most cases, what hypothetical means is that basically when, they, when the annotation was done for a particular genome, there was no homology out there in the database. There was a gene there, it looks like a gene, uh, but when it was blasted against, let's say, um, another database or whatever annotation method was used, um, it, it may have found similarity to other things that are hypothetical or there was no homology out there. Um, and again, depending on the who did the annotation, they're different uh, nomenclatures that I use. So sometimes a gene may be called uh, putative conserved um, fungal protein or, or something like that. And that means that it's conserved in fungi, but um, we don't know what it does and so forth. Um, 
so the question is, should you actually consider these in your SNP analysis? And again, it, it really depends on what you're trying to do. And so if, for example, you know that there's a variable protein in your genome, uh, let's say, let's call it fungal variable protein one <laughs> in this case, and you know it has 200 non-synonymous SNPs in it, right? That's a lot of non-synonymous SNPs, so that's great. And now you found a hypothetical protein or a protein called hypothetical that also has around 300 non-synonymous SNPs. That potentially could be very interesting, right? And you may want to go and look at that and see if that's another member of that variable family or maybe a, 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 it's, it's another novel variable family. And so I personally, I would not ex exclude the hypotheticals. I would definitely include them. Um, and, and I would, again, explore them in the context of other genes in, in the genome. Um, so the other um, question was uh, also in the graphical part of the SNPs, is it possible to get a list of SNPs um, for one gene being shown in a graphical? Um, yes, so you can run a, a search for genes, for um, SNPs based on a gene ID. And so you can add a, a gene ID in the search. So if, uh, if you do go back to the home page um, and you run this, uh, so you can, um, so in the SNP section in the middle of the page, and so you can do it by gene ID all the way at the bottom of that, not the SNP ID. Oh, sorry, by the gene ID. Yeah. yeah. And so then you can enter a specific gene ID, um, and then it'll return all the SNPs that are within that gene. Uh, and you can also you know, play around with the parameters. Yeah, so you would just paste the ID right there. Uh, you would select the, um, you know, the organism uh, you're interested in. This would up update the filter parameters in the bottom, uh, and so you can say you can pick basically the filters and then um, and then run your run your query. Yeah, and the filters right here. Cool. All right. All right. So we'll press on. Um, if you other data sets that I would like to uh, cover briefly be before we move on is um, a data set concerning phenotype evidence. Um, we have integrated uh, several of them. Uh, uh, one came from Fibase, um, and I have um, essentially a link open to Fibase, which is a pathogen host interactions. And we have tried to um, integrate um, as, as many phenotypes as uh, we can for the genomes that currently integrated in FungiDB. And now this is available as a searchable data set. So the list of the organisms from which we integrate the records are listed right here. Um, and on the left, when I clicked on phenotype evidence, um, I was navigated to essentially a search uh, parameter option window, where if you click on the curated phenotypes, the, um, the window on the bottom will be refreshed and uh, it will load an available um, five base curated phenotypes. Uh, we'll give it just a few seconds um, to refresh, but that's essentially, as, as you will see in a few moments, contains um, um, variable menus that you can um, search and pull up records that are um, uh, that, that concern, for example, various um, disease phenotypes or uh, host strains or potentially um, specific strains. In this case, I will click on the disease and, for example, I uh, would be interested in finding all genes that um, are annotated with cryptococcus and by selecting uh, uh, my uh, search um, essentially a choice. I'll click on get answer and as a result um, the search will generate a list of genes that has this particular phenotype um, annotated um, as um, within its records and each of the records can be further searched within the gene record page which I will um, quickly show you just in a second. Our network definitely does not want to cooperate today. Oh, here we are. So my search have uh, identified 52 genes. And notice that um, the genes are listed 
as a um, list within the results table. So if I navigate to individual gene record page by clicking on the gene ID on the left, um, I will be able to um, sort of further gain a little bit more information as to what other information is associated with this particular phenotype. The, this information is found within the phenotype um, section, which is number eight within the gene record page. And um, as you notice, it's just loading and it will appear very quickly. Here we are. Um, the, so th there's a few things that I would like to point out um, as to the structure of um, this section. So five base curated phenotypes are all um, associated with the five base entry, which is provided right here on the left. This entry can be um, searched within the fun uh, five base um, as well. So if you type in here, you will be redirected to um, to um, their records. And furthermore, if you scroll down, you will have a little bit more information as to how this information was obtained and um, also further um, info about uh, pathogen species, uh, various strains that uh, this was annotated in. And um, sometimes we will, um, you will also know, uh, for example, uh, what um, hosts been used to characterize the phenotypes or whether there was any uh, specifically reduced or um, upregulated um, virulence phenotype associated. So um, all of this can be also exported by clicking on the download link. And um, this can be done not only from the individual gene, gene record pages, but if you navigate to the search strategy that you just created, you can export this data in bulk for all of the genes within your list. Okay, so I quickly navigate back and um, just walk you through really quickly about um, if a few uh, updates that we have had as far as the um, annotation goes. All of our summary of annotation updates are always linked within the new section. In this particular case, we have uploaded annotation for Aspergillus niger, which actually came from a user, recently um, user published data sets where they have looked at multiple transcriptomics data from Vera Meyer lab. Um, but in the process, they have also created a, um, a large, um, a library of essentially annotations, and that's for gene products, gene names, um, synonyms, etc., that have been now integrated as part of the gene model. And all of the um, details about this particular updates can be found if you click on the link. And um, the Google Doc will contain not only the uh, general information, but also more details. Okay, Ma, back to you. Okay, thanks, Eve. Um, all right, so I'm going to switch back and um, to my screen. All right, um, and so for the next about 20 minutes or so, I'm going to um, cover a number of different data types and the various resources. Uh, I think one thing to just keep in mind that um, since our databases are all built using the same infrastructure, uh, you know, if we demo an RNA sequence data set in fungi DB. The same type of functionality will be available in all of our other resources, assuming that data type is available. So, for example, I'm looking in um, again at UFATHDB in the news section, and the first database I want to highlight is HostDB, which includes uh, data uh, based on host response to pathogen infection. Um, and the data set, uh, there were a couple of data sets that are available RNA sequence data sets. And so, if I go down to search for genes. Um, and select uh, transcriptomics, RNA sequence evidence. Um, you will see here that uh, there are a number of experiments. Uh, the organism that these experiments were um, done in, or the cell, the cell type at least, is listed here on the left-hand panel. So you could see that we have uh, cow, uh, humans, uh, monkeys, and, uh, and, and mice uh, available. And this list will continue expanding as we add additional uh, hosts. And then you can see here the name of the, the data set, which includes the name of the, the pathogen um, of interest. Uh, and so the idea behind this resource is that it, you can start not only asking about host response to your pathogen of interest, but you can start asking questions that are across various pathogens. For example, are there any genes 
that are upregulated in infected, um, uh, you know, T or Leishmania infected macrophages that are also upregulated in uh, Toxoplasma gondii infected macrophages, right? Two different, very different parasites, both intracellular nevertheless, and the, the host may respond in similar ways or very different ways. And those are the types of questions you can start asking. So I'm going to quickly just demo a type of search in HostDB for this new data set from um, uh, host response to uh, Toxoplasma infection uh, in a chronic, uh, early and chronic infection. And instead of using the full change search that Eve showed you a second ago, I'm going to do the differential expression search. So the differential expression searches are available when the experiment actually included biological replicates, which allows us to then run something like DESeq2. Um, that then uh, gives us some statistics associated with the, with the expression. Um, and so I could, for example, go in and say, uh, so in this experiment, they looked at female and male mice infected with Toxoplasma um, um, chronically, and so over a long period of time. So presumably they're, they're forming cysts in the brain. And, and the question is, is there a, a difference between um, what genes are upregulated in the host uh, compared to... Um, um, an infected host compared to the uninfected host. Um, and again, at the same time, is there a difference also between male and female um, mouse responses? And so I could, again, you're going to compare samples from your comparator sample list to samples from your reference. So the comparator would be the numerator and your reference would be the denominator. Uh, and so I can go in here and say, well, I want to compare the 28-day um, uh, T. gondii infected females to the 28-day uninfected. And you scroll down here, I can say I want to find genes that are only upregulated. Um, I can change this full change to, let's say, 10, and then change the p-value to, let's say, 0 0.005, right? The nice thing about doing this is that you can run the search, and the results may be zero, or, or you may get the number, right? And it's not a big deal. You can always go back and revise any of these, uh, these uh, steps. So I can go in here and revise. It'll populate it with the parameters that I selected. And I can go back and say, well, let's change this to 15-fold because I want something that's higher, right? And so as you run this, you'll notice the number of, of genes obviously went down um, in your result. Um, and as Eve indicated, I can add a step here. And for example, if you want to find a difference, if there is a difference between host response, male mouse host response to female mouse host response, for example, um, I can add a step, select transcriptomic RNA sequence, and again, go to the same experiment. I'm going to select the same type of um, uh, um, uh, analysis, which is a differential expression. And now, instead of comparing um, uh, the uh, infected females to uninfected females, I'm going to uh, compare the infected males to the uninfected males right here. Um, again, I'm going to select upregulated. I will use the same um, uh, fold change, 15-fold in this case. And we'll do the same uh, statistical value of 0.005. Um, and now I can, as soon as you run the search, so this is like a second search, and you have your first search, which was, which was my female mice. And now I have to decide how to combine the results of both searches. And obviously, you're offered these different possibilities. Let's start with an intersect. So we're asking how many genes are in common, um, upregulated in, in female and, and, and male mice during a chronic infection. And you'll see that there are 388 genes, and these are mouse genes. And you can go down and obviously look at them. There are various transcriptional uh, variants of the genes. That's why you see multiple of them, uh, multiple with the same name here. Um, the other thing um, I can do um, is uh, I can go in here and say, well, I'm interested in, in things that are only uh, upregulated in females by 15-fold, but not in males. And so I can edit this parameter here, this combination or set operation or Boolean operation, and I can change it, for example, to 1 minus 2, so these minus these here. And so once I do that and revise, now you'll see that there are 379 genes that are specific uh, or a female-specific response. Um, you know, this obviously is a, is a first step in, in such an analysis, and you would go in and look at these in more detail and, and, and explore, them, explore them further, obviously. The um, next database I wanted to jump to is uh, CryptoDB. Um, and so CryptoDB, um, again, received some uh, new data sets, including um, a new assembled uh, Iowa, uh, Cryptosomium parvum Iowa strain, 
so if you work on Cryptosporidium, this would be a pretty cool um, new addition, which includes a pack bio assembly and re-annotation of the genome. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's a pretty cool data set to look at. Uh, we also have a number of isolates from uh, Nader et al., uh, which uh, came out in um, Nature Microbiology recently. And so these are uh, also would be of interest to look at. Eve already demoed the, um, the, um, the SNP searches. So you can run the same exact SNP searches in CryptoDB as you ran in FungiDB. Um, for uh, the genome, again, um, Eve demoed some of this, so I won't bore you with too many details, but one thing I did want to highlight um, is the ability to, um, uh, to go to the genome browser and look at collinearity between genomes. And again, this would be a feature that would be available in all of our resources. So I'm just going to run a search for um, organism, and uh, if you go under Cryptosporidium parvum, you'll notice that there are two. One is called Iowa 2, and then one is called Iowa ATCC. This is the new one that was that was sequenced. Um, and, and I can select this and click on Get Answer, and this will return all genes, so at about 4,000 genes from uh, this new annotation. And you can look at them right here. Um, Eve may have mentioned this or not, but you can add columns. So for example, if I want to add the chromosome um, number, so I can um, click on Add Columns, it gives me this uh, column selector, which then I can filter on various columns. So I'm going to select chromosome in this case, update. And so this will load an additional column right here, which I can sort and look at um, you know, by chromosome if I want. Um, so I'm just going to select randomly one of the gene pages. So again, this takes me to a gene page. And there are many different sections that will load in the gene page. Some of them take longer than others, um, but there's a uh, genome browser section here that includes the, um, um, the different gene models. But I'm interested in looking at um, uh, orthology and synteny. So if we look at this section of the gene page, you'll see that there's an orthology table, which, um, which is interesting to look at and to compare between different species within the database. Um, but then there's also a synteny um, uh, view right here. Um, the genome browser, uh, J, which we're using JBrowse, is actually very, very touchy. So if you're using a, um, a laptop, and I, which like I do, and I use usually two finger scrolling, I, I often tend to move to the right and left very quickly, which is which is quite annoying. And so that's something that we're looking into um, developing new features for JBrowse to stop it from doing that. But that's obviously out of our hands since we don't necessarily develop the tool itself. Um, but regardless, I can go then to the genome browser itself. So if I click on View in JBrowse, this will open up a new window um, that includes um, uh, that will include the gene models and also it'll include the synteny tracks that we were looking at um, before. Um, and now I can zoom out, for example, if I want, and I can look at um, you know larger sections of the genome. And this, you know, again the, the the more you zoom out, obviously, the, the more information that's being loaded, so it takes longer. But you can see each one of these lines represents one of the genomes in the database. And the shading, uh, and so they're aligned uh, to each other. And then the shading includes, uh, it indicates whether these are orthologs of each other. So you can quickly see that all the genomes in the database that are aligned right here look, look very, very similar to each other, both, ba both based on um, organization and also uh, based on orthology. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight about the genome browser is that you can uh, you can really uh, configure these tracks in many different ways. So, for example, I can show labels, and this will reload the tracks and then show the labels for each of the tracks. So, if you want to see um, which track is uh, oh, actually, what I wanted to do is not to show labels. Um, what I wanted to do is you can go and look at display mode, and now it's compact, but I can change it to normal, for example, and now this will include. Um, these labels, so other labels don't show in um, when you're looking at the compact mode, um, and um, and of course it, it expands things a bit uh, a bit further out. Um, the other thing you can do uh, for specifically for the synteny track, because you may be interested only in comparing, for example, the old Iowa strain and the new ATCC strain to each other, and you don't care about anything else. So what I can do is I can click on this little arrow. And select subtracts, and now this allows you to select the subtracts of your that you want to show. Uh, and so I can unselect everything, select parvum. Uh, this is the ATCC strain, and then these are the two Iowa strains. 
um, and scroll down to the bottom of this window and click on Save. And so this is going to redraw my symptony, but now only comparing the two the two strains. And you can zoom out to to um, um, to a much um, uh, uh, whatever further uh, view or zoomed out view. But of course, the more you zoom out, the the longer it takes um, uh, to load. All right. Um, and so this you know looking at this like this allows you to look. For example, here you can see that these two genes. It looks like they're there's, there's some, something going on here, some kind of a um, transversion or whatever that's called, uh, same thing here. So this would be worth looking at. Um, you can switch between different chromosomes. So let's say you want to look at chromosome 4 now. We were on 8 before, so I can just from the drop-down menu select that. Um, it will uh, go ahead and, and take you to that and, and reload this. Um, I noticed my, my parameters weren't um, stored, um, so we'd have to, have to go back and look at what the problem is. Looks like a little bug. But um, but I think that's the that's the basic um, um, functionality here that I wanted to show you with CryptoDB. Um, the other database I was I'm going to jump to now is um, um, GRDDB, and here I'm only going to highlight a uh, proteomics data set. So again, if we look in in the release, uh, there are a couple of new data sets, um, uh, including um, uh, this new genome here. Um, and but also we loaded a proteomic data set. Uh, again, I'm going to only highlight highlight this only to show you this functionality. Um, so I'm going to go back to the home page, and if you go under proteomics instead of transcriptomics as we were so far, um, you'll notice that there are two types of uh, searches available to you in GRDDB. There are additional searches. For example, if you're interested in post-transitional modifications, and if we have those from a data set, there'll be another search here that allows you to look at PTMs. In this case, there's a mass spec, so I can look for peptides specifically, or I can look at quantitative mass spec. And so if I select quantitative mass spec, you'll see this is the new data set where they compared drug uh, sensitive and resistant um, uh, parasites to each other. It looks just like the RNA sequence query. It's just a regular fold change um, uh, search. And so, for example, I can compare uh, these, um, let's just pick, pick this LFQ is just a method, um, uh, detection method. Uh, so I'm going to compare the metronidazole uh, resistant um, uh, strains compared to the uh, uh, non-resistant strains, for example. Same thing, I can choose up or down regulate, or I can leave it like this and say, well, I want anything that's differentially regulated between the um, sensitive and the resistant. Um, and again, then you get your list of genes, which you can explore further or, or ask additional questions about, about those genes. Um, I'm going to... I know we're running short on time, so I want to highlight um, maybe a couple of additional things. So in um, PlasmoDB, um, again, there are a number of different data sets, including a number of RNA sequence data sets here. Uh, you'll notice that this experiment here that's in malaria-infected um, Gambian children, uh, this was also available in HostDB. Uh, so that's because we also have the host response to um, infection. So um, while we don't have them fully integrated together, you can actually go into PlasmoDB, ask a question about parasite genes that are changing during, between, in this case, between different samples. And you can go to the same samples and ask, is there something different about how the host is responding, responding to both um, infections? Um, in addition to RNA sequence, we loaded uh, ChIP-seq data. Um, this is all available as uh, genome browser tracks. Um, and I will demo one of these quickly uh, just to show you what it looks like. Uh, we also loaded a peptide array, so this allows you to look at, um, uh, explore the immune response to um, plasmodium genes in this case. So are there genes that are uh, antigenic for coming from uh, in, in actual um, serum from um, people living in endemic areas? Uh, and so that could be a, a nice way to find things that are eliciting an immune response. Um, so let me go to back to the home page, and I'm going to go access the genome browser in a different way. So right here under the tools section, you'll see here that it says genome browser. I'm just going to click on genome browser, and it takes me to a um, uh, it'll take me to a view here. Uh, I might have had some reloaded um, tracks which will show up. Okay, so by by default you get the gene model showing. And so now I can select additional tracks. 
And so the key thing I wanted to highlight here is how you can select additional tracks in, in JBrowse if you're not familiar with this. So one is I can start searching. So for example, um, I think the author on that paper was uh, Gomez. So I can just type Gomez and you'll see now it filters all the different data from you know, um, uh, Gomez et al. But you'll notice here it's a mixture of data types. So there's RNA-seq, there's ChIP-seq. And if I was only interested in the ChIP-seq data, I can go to my left panel here and look at the subcategories. And now I can select ChIP-seq, for example. And now it filters only and shows me only the ChIP-seq data from Gomez et al. And you'll notice there are additional things that you can filter on. For example, there's a track type. I can say, well, I only want to look at the multi-density track, for example. And so when you do this, it'll filter here. I can select this. And when I go back to my, my search here, you'll notice now there's this multi-density track. So this each one of these lines represents one of the um, uh, modified histones that they assayed in their, in their um, experiment. Um, and the darker uh, the spots, the more, uh, the higher the peak was in that area. So you could, for example, look here, and you'll see that there's a really dark spot right here in front of this gene, so whatever this gene is. And you can say, well, it looks like maybe there's a peak here in um, these two samples, the Midgard Oasis, um, uh, Midgard Oasis samples. Okay? Um, and so this is one way you can do this. You can obviously look at the, the actual uh, coverage plots themselves. So you can say, well, I want to load the actual coverages themselves. So as I click on these, You'll notice in the background these start loading right here uh, and you can see here are these high peaks that correspond to these darker lines uh, right here all right um, i'm going to quickly hop to um, actually i'm going to skip tri -trip db for a second and if we have time i'll come back to it i want to make sure before the end of this webinar to highlight uh, one new exciting um, data set that we loaded in uh, in ToxoDB uh, in the most recent release. So in addition to genomes, a bunch of uh, proteomics data and RNA sequence data, set, data sets, we loaded this experiment called uh, Hyperlopid uh, Global Mapping of um, uh, Protein Subcellular Localization. So this is coming from uh, Ross Waller groups in Cambridge. Um, the nice thing about this data set is that what they did is they, in addition to subcellular fractionation of their samples, they then used a computational clustering to um, identify uh, clusters of proteins that uh, co-localize. And this allowed them to statistically and, and actually quite robustly um, identify lists of genes that are coming from the same compartment. Um, and, and there's more information, as um, uh, Eve indicated earlier, in each data set record page. There's information about what um, uh, what um, uh, 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 you know what the experiment was and how it was done and so forth and if the paper is available it'll be linked in this case uh, the Russ Waller group was really gracious to make this data available pre-publication to the community and I think that's really outstanding you can go here and, and look at the search um, and so I want to highlight this quickly uh, and so this search allows you to uh, filter they use two different methods in their analyses, so I'll just keep it at MCMC. It doesn't matter what the statistical method here is for, for our purposes right now. Um, and let's say I'm interested in things that are in the apicoplast, so I can um, uh, filter here. I can select apicoplast probability. And now you'll notice that there, there's obviously a skewing. There's a bunch of proteins that are got a score of one, many got, got a score of zero, which is not surprising. But I would be interested only in these top ones here. So I can click and drag, and this will immediately set the parameters to only return genes um, from this list. Um, and now I can click on Get Answer. And you'll see here that there are now 143 genes that had a high degree of confidence that they are localized to the apicoplast from uh, not only subcellular, uh, from the subcellular combined with the uh, uh, clustering uh, um, uh, method that they used. Um, and you'll see here that there's a graphical representation here on the on the right as well that shows you the probability. This is a nice way to look at, well, what were the other compartments that I found? And sometimes, you know, if you, I, I, I selected specifically things that are really high, so it's not surprising, but you could imagine that things are localizing to multiple compartments and that would appear uh, right here as well. And so here's an example where um, this gene was, was for, from one method, it was highly likely to be localized in the apicoplast. The other method, statistical method, it's actually um, all over the place, 
and it's considered an outlier where they, they could not really be confident about its uh, apical, uh, apical blast localization. So again, depending on your, your threshold, you may decide, well, maybe I'm going to exclude this one. Or, uh, of course, you know, it's always good to look at these, these proteins, and sometimes they're known to be um, localized in the apical blast. All right, so we are, um, uh, we are, I think, at the end of the webinar. So I am not going to um, cover any much more, just because I know people have um, other things to do. Um, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, the recording of this webinar will be made available. You'll both get a link. Uh, and also, we will, um, uh, we will make it available as a YouTube channel so you can share it with your colleagues. Um, we will have additional webinars um, in the new year, uh, especially as we come closer to our um, new combined release with VectorBase. And so that's a very exciting uh, time for, for everybody. And hopefully, we'll have some many new tools that would be uh, useful to you. One thing to, an important thing to point out is that if you ever have questions, so you don't have to wait for a webinar to ask these questions. You can always click on the Contact Us link. You'll see it here at the top right-hand corner of all of our pages, or at the bottom of the pages as well. And um, uh, we, we try and respond within 48 hours, um, you know, but, but hopefully no longer than three days. Um, and you can ask us anything, anything, you know, whether you're just simply looking for a search, or you have um, a more complicated question, or you have suggestions. If you see something that's really not working right, or you think it's a bug, you know, let us know because we that, that information is quite useful to us. Um, I think that's it. Eve, is there anything else you wanted to add, or are we good? Yeah, I think we're good. I don't have anything to add. Okay. And um, any more questions? Maybe I'll give people a couple more seconds to see if anybody has a question. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks everybody for joining and uh, we will see you uh, next time. All right, bye-bye. Bye, thanks very much.